Hello everyone, my name is Pamela Pitcher and welcome to my podcast, Awaken to the Best You. This podcast is designed to inspire and propel you to a newfound level of empowerment and clarity. Through cultivating the art of thinking, you'll learn how to detangle your thought knots and train your brain to break through obstacles. You'll learn to focus on what matters most and make effective choices to become a remarkable you. Hello, lovely listeners. In last week's podcast, I discussed phobias. Through my own experience as a phobia sufferer and as an NLP practitioner and hypnotherapist who has successfully worked with clients with phobias, I know that phobias can be cured. Thank goodness there is help because phobias are no fun at all. This week, I'm going to delve further into the topic of anxiety. Phobias are just one type of anxiety disorder. With anxiety, there's a lot more at play. Some people suffer silently with anxiety, and there is no reason for that when there is help out there and several ways we can help ourselves. It is my hope that this podcast will provide you with insights as to what causes anxiety and what can be done about it. As per usual, I'll be sharing part of my own story. I had reached my mid-30s, and my career was on the rise in the finance industry. I was working at a branch of a trust company in West Vancouver, one of the most affluent areas of Canada, and it still is today. We were having a client appreciation day where we offered cakes and cookies and full-bodied coffee from the local Java shop to our clients. And the coffee was delicious. It was strong. They kept bringing in fresh brewed coffee, and I was an avid coffee drinker at the time, so I was happy. I was in the lunchroom on a coffee break when suddenly my heart began to race. My palms became sweaty and my head started to spin. My father had died of heart trouble when he was just 45. I began to worry that maybe I had inherited his heart because I couldn't breathe. I was so afraid I had never known such pounding in my heart before. And as the seconds passed by, the more intense my symptoms became. My fear deepened. I didn't know what was happening. My work colleagues called the ambulance who took me to the hospital. There they gave me oxygen and told me to breathe deeply. The doctor did a couple of basic tests and then told me that I hadn't suffered a heart attack. What I had had was a panic attack. A panic attack? I'd never heard of such a thing. They recommended I go to my GP so she could run further tests to learn what may have brought this on. My doctor was on vacation, so I made the appointment for a few weeks later. In the meantime, I had another panic attack in our SUV as my husband drove across a bridge. I was terrified to cross the bridge. What's wrong with me? I just couldn't get that question out of my mind. Maybe there's something wrong with my brain, I wondered. When I got in to see the doctor after I described the symptoms and the circumstance to her, The first thing she asked me was how much coffee I drank. I'd been drinking coffee since I was a teenager and easily consumed four to six cups a day. The day of my first panic attack, I must have had at least 10 cups because the coffee was so good. On client appreciation day, the coffee station was beside my desk so I could easily reach for more. My doctor went on to say that many of her female patients had to stop drinking coffee in their mid-30s because caffeine affected them adversely. I was one of them. I gave up coffee and tea and the panic attack stopped for a little while. But then came the onslaught of phobias, bridge fear, vertigo, fear of flying, all brought on the same panic symptoms, heart palpitations, sweaty palms, etc., I saw my doctor again after a trip to Jamaica where I thought I was going to lose it on the flights because I panicked the entire time we were in the air. It was exhausting. I get off the plane and just a ball of, oh, I don't know, exhaustion really. (laughs) Anyway, she prescribed some tools for me. Interestingly, she didn't prescribe any pills for me. She gave me a visualization to do at the beginning of a panic attack. She also recommended that I listen to soothing music and keep myself busy not to think about my fear. 
I had given up smoking 10 years prior, but when I knew I had to drive over a bridge, I would sneak a couple of cigarettes from my husband and keep them in the glove compartment as smoking calmed my rattled nerves at the end of a bridge encounter. I disliked everything about smoking, but for the hit of nicotine that offered me an oasis of calm. One afternoon, I was in a client meeting when suddenly I could feel a panic attack start. I would excuse myself, go to the restroom, begin deep breathing while I did my visualization. And I managed to calm myself down in about five minutes to the point where I could conduct a client meeting. That happened a few times. The panic attacks had now extended beyond the phobias. They were with me in everyday work life. I'm not going to repeat my story from podcast 27, Phobias. You can listen to that one if you're interested. Suffice it to say, I was in an unhappy marriage. I had been since the very beginning, and my discontent worsened with each year. I was too frightened to leave the marriage. I was in between a rock and a hard place. I felt stuck. I couldn't see my way out. I was searching for ways out of the marriage without having to hurt my husband, his family, my mom. I spent hours worrying what to do. What am I going to do? One night, my husband came home very late from work. I thought he might have been in a car accident. I realized in a flash that I was experiencing relief at the thought of him being in a fatal car crash because I wouldn't have to tell him that I wanted a divorce. And still, I stayed in the marriage for another three years. I detested conflict, and leaving the marriage was unavoidable inevitable, yet I dragged on searching for ways to make the marriage work. I continued to avoid caffeine. I exercised constantly when I wasn't working or studying. I did my visualization faithfully. I eventually left my husband. My panic attacks stopped and my phobic symptoms eased. I started smoking again after I left my husband. Even though I was the one who left the marriage, I experienced a significant sense of loss. At times, I thought I was going crazy, so I began a deep dive into working on myself. Sometimes the physical symptoms of anxiety are unbelievable, unbearable. We question our thoughts. We realize that we're being irrational, yet the fear remains. And why is that? The answer lies in a tiny almond-shaped structure deep inside the limbic system, the emotional part of the brain. My brothers teased me so much when I was a little girl. They'd throw me around the living room, twist my arms, hit me, make fun of me. And after a teasing round with my brothers, I would inevitably end up in tears. I cannot remember a Saturday morning when I was a little girl where I wasn't in tears as mom slept in. My tears became so commonplace. My mom was at her wit's end. She would say to me time and time again, stop being so emotional. I was being emotional because I was in fight or flight, and I was too little to fight. The emotional brain is the oldest, most primitive part of the brain. It was designed to ensure our physical survival. In caveman days, we needed the unconscious instinct to protect ourselves from bears and snakes and other tribes. It was unconscious because we needed to act quickly without conscious analysis that would have only slowed us down and ensure our demise. That bear would have got us. Consequently, the emotions like fear became automatic in humans. Nowadays, we don't fight for physical survival unless we're in the armed forces, in a street gang, and the like. Today, we fight for social and psychological survival. The amygdala operates unconsciously. We cannot consciously control its quick, instinctive reactions. When the amygdala is stimulated, it fires signals to our brain and body to make our bodies ready for fight or flight. And this is a good thing most times. The amygdala switches off its alarm when it believes that there is safety. Once the amygdala is switched off, symptoms reverse themselves to normal. Heart rate, breathing, focus, all go back to normal. I have suffered a lot of emotional trauma and distress in my life. Ever since my father passed away when I was five, I have been 
in fight or flight mode due to the wacky cast of characters and circumstances in my life, and this has resulted in adrenal fatigue later on in life. I've spent a great deal of my inner work on improving the quality of my thoughts, because thoughts and memories trigger the amygdala, which gives us bodily sensations of anxiety. I am, and still am, and have been training my amygdala to know that I am safe. It's important to find the triggers that may cause us anxiety. When I allowed myself to think of that little girl being teased over and over, for being a, that little girl in a house full of boys, for being the youngest, for being daddy's favorite, I would feel sadness, anger, a whole host of emotion that in turn made me feel really bad. Now when I think those thoughts, I give them no power. I have learned techniques to shrink those thoughts. The most impactful thing I do is catch myself having the thought. I am aware. I am aware of my thoughts. It is only a thought. A thought is a thing. A memory is in the past. You see, all along the journey of our lives, what we can rely on is our mind and the thoughts and stories we tell ourselves will determine how well we're doing with our internal life and dare say our internal life determines what our external life looks like. This is emotional intelligence. How wise and developed are you? When anxiety is our reality, it usually means that our mind isn't working very well to solve our problems. The reality of what is, is distorted. To bring us back to rational thinking and manage an overreactive amygdala, Managing our thoughts through awareness is the key. Realize when you've been triggered. Let go of that story. The past is the past. Release the tension. Remember who you really are. And if you can't let go of the story, ask yourself if the thought you're thinking is true. Is it true? Can you know for sure? Is it true or are you speculating? And speculation is a surefire way to induce anxiety. Ask yourself, how is that thought serving me? If it's giving you nothing but stress, why not think about something else? Engage your senses to train your amygdala. Remember, your unconscious mind doesn't know the difference between what is real and imagined, so it's important to imagine well. Your unconscious mind communicates with feelings and emotions, so you need to focus well to alleviate the feeling of anxiety. Visually, look at something that gives you joy, that calms you. The sea, trees, moonlit sky, your partner's face, the face of your child, your dog. For me, it's my cats. My cats and nature always calm me down. Use your gift of hearing. Listen to calm music, sounds of nature, a helpful podcast, play the piano, feel Feel the breeze against your face, the warmth of a bath with lavender oil, holding the hand of the one you love, gentle easing stretches of yoga, take deep breaths, moving the air in and out of your lungs, feel that air moving within your body. Exercise has been and continues to be my savior in reducing anxiety. Exercise lowers stress hormones such as cortisol. It also releases endorphins, which are chemicals to improve your mood. Smell. Smell can be a huge positive trigger for us. What smells make you feel good? Here is a good use of memory. The smell of bacon and coffee in the morning always makes me feel good because it reminds me of the wonderful breakfast with mum on the weekends. Even though I don't drink coffee, I love the smell of coffee. The smell of a rose, a freshly baked bread. I don't know who doesn't like that smell. Freshly cut grass. What smell makes you feel good? Find it and go and smell it. And taste. For me, it's a soothing cup of tea. I love the taste, the way it smells, the warmth going down my throat. I even like the way my cup looks in my hands. Tea brings me memories of good times. Drinking tea with my late brother, playing Scrabble with my best friend while drinking tea into the wee hours of the morning. And I'm drinking tea now while recording this podcast. Sight, hear, feel, smell, and taste to bring goodness into your life. 
Improve the quality of your sleep to reduce anxiety. This is a big one. And when we're suffering anxiety, I know sleep isn't always easy. Sleep doesn't come easy to me. I love to think. I can quiet my mind to meditate, yet it's not so easy for me to do the same to sleep. It's another reason why I exercise. It greatly improves the quality of my sleep. I also drink a tea blend with rhubarb, chamomile, licorice, vanilla, cinnamon, cardamom, lemon balm, nutmeg, ginger cloves, and black pepper. I'll take an herbal sedative with valerian root as of late and drops of CPD oil. When none of that is working, I listen to hypnotherapy for sleep. To wind down, I often take a bath with Epsom salts and a foaming bath oil with lavender. I use essential oils in a diffuser of bergamot and lemon. Aromatherapy can lower anxiety and stress. And now, my relationship with coffee? It's non-existent. I don't think about it, but sometimes I do drink it. For example, when I travel to Italy where a good cup of tea cannot be had, not for lack of trying on my part, I will have a cup of tea. When I quit coffee all those years ago, I found a good quality decaf that satisfied me. It really does help. Tea soothes me. I drink it now, obviously, and it doesn't cause me anxiety. And smoking, I don't do that anymore. Wish I never did, but hey, we all do the best we can with what we've got at the time. I grew up in a house of smokers. I was married to a smoker. I worked in nightclubs full of smokers. The past is the past. I practice gratitude and ensure it's a daily ritual during high times of stress, for sure. It helps us redirect our thoughts to the positive things in life instead of dwelling on the negative. Worry is nothing but endless loop thinking with no resolution. It's a surefire way to make yourself feel bad. Over the years, I've found journaling a great way to clear my thoughts and release anxiety. Being with like-minded friends and family helps me to feel a sense of belonging and self-worth. Laughter is great medicine. Happily, comedies are my husband's favorite movies to watch. And I've introduced him to Saturday Night Live, which always lightens the mood. And isn't comedy better than watching the news these days? Meditation, deep breathing, mindfulness are all super ways to calm the mind, as is interacting with a pet, which helps to release oxytocin. I love playing and petting my cats. Sometimes getting help from a professional is necessary. I became a practitioner of the emotional freedom technique. It has helped me greatly during times of high anxiety. EFT is a form of psychological acupressure based on the same energy meridians used in traditional acupuncture. There's no use of needles. Instead, simple tapping with the fingertips is used to input kinetic energy onto the specific meridians on the head and chest while thinking about a specific problem. It's simple and effective, and there's lots of lessons to learn how to online. I became a hypnotherapist because hypnotherapy has worked so well for me. I use Ericksonian hypnotherapy, or indirect hypnosis as it's called. The term used to describe a very specific type of hypnosis, which is hallmarked using indirect suggestion, metaphor, and storytelling. For me, being a recipient of this kind of hypnotherapy is like listening to a bedtime story, allowing me to drift off and dream as my guide takes me through journeys of healing. If you listen to my podcast with the guided meditations, I hope they help you to soothe your soul. It's a bit of indirect hypnosis. Neurolinguistic programming has many techniques that can reduce anxiety. Let me tell you about an amazing NLP experience I had that has changed my life. When I was 12, Mum fell in love with a man named Bill. He moved in with us. Bill had been a prize-fighting boxer in university. The Bill I came to know was an alcoholic. When he drank, he would beat my mother. The beautiful woman that was my mother became a battered woman. Bill died when I was 18, thankfully. However, those six years affected me profoundly. With the help of a good psychologist, I realized that there was nothing more I could have done to help my mom during that time. I worked through the anger of what I saw as her choosing him over her children, of making excuses for him, 
submitting herself to the degradation and ultimately becoming a hardcore alcoholic herself. He would hit her and she'd spew venom at me if I tried to get her to move away, if I tried to get her to stop. I finally got it. That was their stuff, not my stuff. I worked through it logically and consciously, but if I was to talk about that time in my life with you, I'd begin to cry. If I started to think back about those horrific times, I would cry, all by myself, alone in the room. At night, I had reoccurring dreams of him beating her. I'd wake up startled and begin to cry. Thirty-something years later, I could slip back into the vortex of pain and shame and anger as though it were yesterday and get, as my mum said, too emotional. I took my master practitioner course in NLP in Miami, Florida. One of the trainers was named Scott, and for Scott, I am eternally grateful. He told us that tomorrow he was going to show us the trauma release pattern. And was there anyone out there who suffered from a traumatic event and would like to release the pain from it? I raised my hand amongst others. He chose me. The next day he said that he chose me because he had never seen anyone raise their hand so quickly with so much enthusiasm before. I had had enough of the pain that the memory of Bill was causing me. Enough was enough. When we started, he asked, Pam, on a scale of 0 to 10, 0 being no emotion and 10 being extreme emotion, how would you rate this time in your life when you think about it? It being, you know, what Bill was doing with mom. I gave it a 9. 30 minutes later, we had completed the trauma release pattern. My intensity was down to a 2. I never dreamt of Bill again, and as you can hear, I can talk about this time in my life without tears. The trauma release pattern, as well as the fast phobia cure as discussed in my last podcast, reverse the traumatic events time sequence by running a movie of the event backward. The trauma process also has a client associate into the movie and run it backward, which reverses its sequence kinesthetically, spatially using a timeline. The trauma release pattern is not something I would do online. It's not something I would suggest you try yourself. You need a seasoned practitioner who can guide you. From my perspective, it is really important that that person be with you in the room. Sometimes medication may be required, but I'm not qualified to discuss that, so I'm not going to. The point is that there are a lot of people who can help you with anxiety, and you can help yourself in several ways. Next week's podcast will be a guided meditation to help reduce stress and anxiety. You can listen to it as and when you need to. Now I'm going to provide you with a visualization that my GP recommended to me all those years ago to help with my phobias and panic attacks. And this will only take a few minutes. So go find yourself a quiet space where you won't be disturbed Put your phone on, do not disturb, sit down or lie down somewhere comfortable and begin to breathe deeply. Close your eyes and begin to pay close attention to your breathing. Take a few long, deep breaths in and out. Mindfully allow your entire body to relax as you focus your attention on your breathing. Deep breaths in and deep breaths out. Keep breathing deeply as you visualize the following. You find yourself walking down a path in the lovely countryside beside a babbling brook. As you walk along, pay attention to the sounds and the smells of the trees, grasses, flowers, birds and the sound of the water flowing over the rocks in the brook or stream. The path along the brook is leading you to your very special place where you can relax and feel carefree. You will be the only one there. This is your magical place of healing, of relaxing, of unwinding, In a moment, your feet lead you to your special place. There you are. With the power of your imagination, fill your space with everything you love and enjoy in nature. 
There are no people there at all, just you with Mother Nature and her resplendent symphony. You can wear whatever you want to be wearing. You don't have to be wearing anything at all. The sun can be shining, it can be cloudy, the weather can be warm or cool, whatever you need to feel relaxed. Just take it all in as you continue to breathe deeply and relax. You find yourself admiring the view. Now slowly turn around in your space. And just behind you, there you find a very large boulder. How large it is is dependent on your level of anxiety. Equate the size of the boulder to the anxiety you are now feeling. Now use your imagination and focus on slowly shrinking the boulder. Shrink it down. Shrink it until it falls to pieces. And then shrink those pieces of rock until all that is left is sand that you can run through with your fingers. All there is is grains of sand that you can pick up, run through your fingers, and it falls back to the ground. No bits of rock left. Continue to imagine that until the boulder has disintegrated into sand. And when the rock has turned to sand, open your eyes. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you put this visualization to good use. Remember, what you consciously focus on is a choice. If you catch yourself having an old thought, you've begun awareness of what is no longer serving you. Just watch those thoughts from a distance and distract yourself from those thoughts with this visualization or playing with your puppy or journaling or having a cup of tea, whatever floats your boat. Train your amygdala that it no longer has the upper hand because here you are dealing with your triggers with awareness. Be proud of yourself. Those triggers started somewhere to keep you safe. You're here. You've made it through. It's time for a new pair of slippers for your journey ahead. Please remember to subscribe and share across social media. I'd really appreciate that, as Awaken to the Best You is my way of giving back. The more, the merrier. And I'd also love to read your comments, so please send your feedback my way so I know how to help you the most. Thank you again. Ciao for now.